<laughs> went to it. <laughs> you know, we were, <laughs> of course, I wanted to know more about this delicious drink. And Vladimir was telling me about the, the plums and what a beautiful aroma it is as you're driving through the countryside because they pick those plums and as they're fermenting, right? All right. You know, the plums here, you find them under the term Italian plums, but they are just normal plums. And they have to be here ripened. You, you buy them here and they are half green, which is, which they don't taste too well and they are very hard, but still we usually pick up the ripened plums and Kitty makes a special fruit dumplings. Ooh, that's another, that's another mm. special meal that you I can I might come find. here often, you know. Yeah, but you have to wait until the, the day ripe. Oh, okay. So anyway. Anyway, in the countryside, in the eastern part of former Czechoslovakia, and in Balkans, in Yugoslavia, they pick up the plums from the trees, put them in the barrels, let them add some water to them, and let them there, and they start to ferment. And you can smell the aroma of fermenting plums as you drive through, the, you countryside. Drive through the countryside. So you oh. actually can get drunk just <laughs> breathing <your> deeply. <laughs> I think I want to go with you next time you go. Of course, it's not the same as when you drink it, right? <laughs> You haven't been there since 2002, right? Three the last ago? time, the last time we were there was 2002, in the fall. Now we need our, we need before we go any farther, we need a geography lesson here, because I didn't know what's happened to Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic. Tell me what happened. Well, Czechoslovakia was a state created in 1918 after they broke down Austrian Hungarian Empire and they created a lot of small states out of it. So they took the western part of Czechoslovakia, which was Bohemia, and Bohemia had an old tradition of being an independent state and then a kingdom. And for some times it was really, during the Middle Ages, it was a large kingdom, it was a Roman kingdom, with the borders down to the Italy and north to the uh, Poland and to the Germany. The eastern part, Slovakia, was created from parts of Poland and parts of Hungary, inhabited with people, with Slavs, Slovaks. So two nations that had similar languages, Slovak and Czech, formed a new state called Czechoslovakia. The languages were not the same, but they were very similar. Czechs could understand Slovaks, Slovaks could understand Czechs. But the relationship between these two was sometimes a little bit difficult. It was something like a relationship between the United States and Canada. Yeah. Slovaks were mainly agriculture uh, country and uh, didn't have the tradition as the Czechs have. The Slovaks always felt that they are somehow uh, less qualified and uh, subordinated to the Czech people which was not true, but the feeling is what counts. They lived together for 20 years when the Germans decided to occupy Czechoslovakia after the Munich uh, Agreement, when they took the border region of the western part of Czechoslovakia where the minority of German lived. The Slovaks decided to separate from the Czechoslovakia and to create an independent state, a Slovak state. So the Germans practically occupied only the western part of Czechoslovakia, the Bohemia, and created the protectorate from Bohemia. Slovaks finally were so-called independent. Of course, they were a vassal German state, Nazi state. The president of Slovakia and the prime minister of Slovakia who were actually uh, priests, uh, supported Hitler. The Slovak army volunteered to join the German army in the fight against Soviet Union, and they accepted all the Nazis' policies. After the war, the Slovaks and the Czechs were again reunited in Czechoslovakia. But the Slovaks get the feeling of independent states. So it was not Czechoslovakia, it was Czech-Slovakia. Then it was 
Czech okay. and Slovak Republic. Eh? Okay. And finally, the Czech, so the, the point was, you know, that there was more and more administration because it was Czech government, Slovak government, and the federal Czech and Slovak government. Now, the small country like Czechoslovakia or Czechoslovakia with all together about 15 million people couldn't support thousands and thousands of bureaucrats who didn't do anything. I remember one joke in the old, uh, after the war, Czechoslovakia, when a Slovak who lives in Prague meets a friend and the friend asks, what are you doing here? Well, I am in the government here. Well, what are you doing in the government? Well, I am a Slovak there. Yeah. See? So finally they decided peacefully to separate and create two independent states, Czech Republic and Slovakia, which I think is the best. It's definitely better than to fight when the minority or when part of the nation want to be independent, they are independent now. So that happened when? When did that happen? That happened in 19... 1989. So you, you had already been here for 20 years when that happened? Yes, yes, yeah. because we left. Now, after the war, of course, the communists uh, communist liberated Czechoslovakia, or Slovakia and Bohemia. The, the Soviet Union liberated them. Uh, immediately after the war, there was still democracy. But there was a very strong communist party created. A lot of people supported Soviet Union and believed the Soviets separated us, uh, liberated us, and Soviet never, uh, never caused our occupation because it was mainly England and France with whom the pre-war Czechoslovakia had agreements of defense who actually said, we will not defend you, you have to give the border region to uh, Hitler, that was the Chamberlain, right, in England, and the only agreement with Soviet Union was that Soviet Union will defend Czechoslovakia only when British and France will defend them. But because British and France didn't defend Czechoslovakia, Soviet couldn't go in, and the German, the Nazis were free to occupy Bohemia, and the Slovakia separated. After the war, when the Czechoslovakia was recreated, the Communist Party became a very strong party. In 1948, they, of course, uh, used their strengths and caused a non-violent non -violent, uh, overthrow of the government, and the democratic Czechoslovakia became a communist country. People slowly started to dislike Soviet Union. It was mainly that the communists started to push everything Soviet through the throats of Czech people. For, to tell you the truth, I, for a long time I believed that yes, the Soviets are really uh, something we have to follow and they are better than we are and everything is better in Soviet Union. First of all, we didn't have any uh, contacts and any information from the West. And the Soviets was a big, huge country. And until I visited for the first time the Soviet Union, I really believed that so Soviets are better than we are. But once I was in Soviet Union, and that was in 19... 56 or 1957, I realized that it's, it's, it's not true. And they are not better. You formed a different opinion the, entirely. Yeah, they are not better. What a volatile past, though, yeah. for your country. It's very but, interesting, interesting history, and a lot of that history is better off behind you than in front of you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it was very difficult. And slowly a lot of people started to realize that really the Soviet, and not only the economy of the Soviet Union, but even the political regime of the Soviet Union is not better than the former regime of Czechoslovakia or the regimes in the Western Europe and United States. And they started to work slowly to change it. So finally, 
it was in 1968, again, still the Communist Party was the dominating party, but inside the Communist Party, there was a coup, a change of leadership. And that led to a slow but significant change of the leadership of the Czechoslovakian government. And the Soviets got so scared of it that they decided to forcefully occupy Czechoslovakia. So the Soviets and the armies of all the vassal communist countries, which is Poland, uh, Germany, Hungary, entered Czechoslovakia and the armies occupied Czechoslovakia. And that reminds me, that reminded me so much of the German occupation before the Second World War that I decided if I can, I will leave with my family and I will I thought what will happen. Unfortunately, at that time I had uh, several friends abroad and they offered me I just, uh, they offered me a job because I didn't dare to uh, just leave the country with two children, one teenager, 13 years old, the other one, 18 oh years old, goodness, really? and wait somewhere in the refugee camp and start to look for a job or something like this. I had a friend at that time, a former student of mine, who was in uh, Switzerland and a good friend who was in Germany and I contacted them and gave them a list of several of my f professional friends if they can ask them to find a position for me. So I got an offer in Italy and in Denmark and I knew at the time a dean of uh, science and mathematics here, Dr. Perkins, you may remember mm -hmm. him. Yeah, absolutely. Because he was, we were pen friends for many years and he visited Czechoslovakia or Prague a couple of years before and since then he was inviting me to come over to Plattsburgh as visiting professor, but I never had time to do it. And so the friend who contacted Perkins wrote me, first of all, if you are afraid that there will be war in Europe and you want to leave, leave Europe. There is no point to go to Denmark because the Soviets will take Denmark the same way as they will take Czechoslovakia. Go to the United States. Second, Perkins immediately offered to send me an invitation as visiting professor. Wow. So I accepted it and that's, I would say, the end of the story how, you, how we get it. And the rest is history, as they say. Isn't that an amazing story? And I, I truly appreciate that little piece of that history lesson here today because <coughs> Calvin and I like to think we're informed, but most of that is brand new information for me, so I'm glad you shared that with us. Uh, there were some small hitches in uh, getting here. For example, Perkin had to send me an official invitation. I had my passport, I had a professional passport, that was no problem. Children had passports because two years before they visited my friend who was in Italy at the time, but Kitty didn't have any passport and I needed a passport for her. So she needed an invitation from somebody else and she had her old, uh, who was she, the, the one in Austria? Your, your friend who offered you an invitation? And in, uh, somebody in Austria? That was the one who was taking care of you when you were, when you were a child. You mean only? Oh, by my governess. Oh, really? I had a governess for, since I was born until I was 10 years old. Come on! The same woman. See, it's a whole she different was, life than we're yeah. used to. And she was Austrian by birth, but uh, she was adopted and then she moved into, into Czechoslovakia. And uh, my parents had hired her when I got home from the hospital, when I was born. And we, we actually was in touch even when, you know, we left until the day she died. Isn't She's an old lady. Beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? And she was more like a mother to me. Oh, because sure, I really, I really believe that she's the one who I can turn to whenever I needed someone. She was perfect. She didn't speak a word of Czech. She was, you know, talking only in, in well, it's an Austrian, uh, it's actually, it is German, but kind of transferred into, into something more. And 
My kids didn't speak her language, but she came to visit. They loved her. They felt like, uh, the kids really felt like she's part of the family. And they never spoke her language and she never learned Czech. Isn't that amazing? It, it, really, it really worked for them and uh, she, we were in touch until the time when she was old and died. That's a beautiful story and as she a child... More, she was more like a mother to me than my own mother. Yeah. It happens in families sometimes. And you probably learned to speak her language fluently or at least no, under... I, I knew the language because I, I was born in the border region. Ah. Which means we spoke two, two languages and it only differed in what school you went into. So for, for, for my first year, in, it was nothing but German. So I, I already knew the German from her, of course. And uh, after, well, actually, the, the last year that we were there, I, I was sent to a Czech school, where I learned Czech. In, in Czechoslovakia, you have to learn Czech. It's, there's no way out. But at that time, I was 10 years old. So, uh, well, I don't know how to, how to kind of connect it to our life, but she really was an influence. That's wonderful to say that, because there are people besides our own parents who had a huge influence on our life. For me, it was, it was teachers, you know. I didn't know my parents as well as I knew her, and yeah. it worked Think that way. Think about it. Yeah. What the governess is our for, right? Huh? That's what the governess is our for. But they're yeah. true. But she, really but she was a special. Yeah. She was she very, was a, she very was, special. Uh, she really influenced whatever. Even now, I hear her when she said, Do <laughs> I love it. You know, you, you wouldn't hear believe her it. Voice giving you I instructions, think, huh? No, it, it was <laughs> do something. Yeah. That was her favorite. Do something. Do Don't something. sit. Do something. So she taught me how to embroider, how to knit, and I, you know, whatever she knew, I knew, and we were really very close. Isn't that a wonderful legacy for somebody to leave after they've imparted their beliefs? We actually parted when I was ten years old, and we kept in touch as long as she is. She was alive. See that? That's a beautiful story. I love to hear that. And who, you know, Cal Calvin and I have talked about it before because sometimes we have to try to remember who our true mentors were when we were young. And it wasn't was always our mother and father. It might have been some special teacher. I didn't have much connected with my, with my parents because actually my parents were so busy with their own lives that uh, us kids, we, we lived on our own. Because there was my brother at that time and my cousin who was living with us because of the schooling where he was, where, her parents, where his parents were living, there was no way that they could learn the language or do anything else besides going to school and it would have been German anyway. So we actually lived our own life. And we saw our parents at noon because that was the main meal where we got together. And uh, my dad was in a hurry because he wanted to take a nap before he had to go back. Actually, we lived in, the, in a villa that was connected to the factory where my dad was working. Ah, and he was the director, so the, you know, he had certain privileges. Of course, so he was, okay. he was, he was taking, uh, you know, at noon. And, and one hour that he spent, like, eating in a hurry and go to sleep for, an, for the rest of the time. And f f we went to a Czech school, which means that we, we spoke Czech and the German at the same time. So you know, how many languages can you speak today? Well, ch Czech, of course, German, and Russian. Is it? And Russian, because, too? Yeah, because I, I decided that I have to learn the language of people who actually liberated us from the Germans. Isn't that amazing? So, and, and, and not English? only that, the, the infant, and English. Well, English I didn't know until. Uh, now you do. Well, you no, I mean, we, I mean, I, I learned it later yeah. on, but not as a small child. I, yeah, I would yeah. say, and the funny thing is that my mom was born in Chicago. Come and, on! No, come <laughs> on! Grandpa. It took us a while to get to your mother was born in Chicago. Yep. <laughs> Not only she, but uh, four of her, the, the three of her siblings, there were four of them. And Grandpa was the one who, who really was, I don't know what, what, what he did for a living, I don't remember. But he was, he was moving the family. I love it. He was moving the family back and forth and back and forth because he ran away from home when he was 18. 
and ended up in, in New York in New York, where he was told that the Czech people live around, uh, you know, in uh, Chicago and, and that place. So he met his future wife, my grandma, who was Czech by, by birth, and they moved to the States. And then they went back and forth and back and forth and they ended up in Prague. Isn't that amazing? You know, I speak about the languages here because I'm embarrassed to only be able to speak one language. Really? We're here on the border with Quebec, and I can't even speak French, and it's embarrassing I, I because... I don't know French either, but uh, I learned English. And well, I you certainly did. You're very, well, <laughs> you're very facile with the language. It's been a you're long wonderful. time. I was, the first time I was here was in 1947. I was single at that time, and my parents decided that Europe is not for them, for one simple reason. They lost most of the, our family was killed, and we were the only ones surviving. So the, my mom had a brother and a sister in Chicago, so she decided that she's going to go as, as an American citizen. She was actually, I think it was free of charge that they were taking people with American citizenship. They could go home. So she went home, which means that she lived with, in Chicago with her brother and her sister-in-law for a while, until my dad and I came. And I promised that I'm going to come back to him because we were dating at the time. Oh, here's the good part. Now, yeah, here's now the we are good getting part. there. Yes. But <laughs> as soon as I, my dad passed away, I was very close to my dad, but not to my mom because my mom was com completely, my brother was, was for her the way to live. And when he didn't return from, you know, we, were, we actually ended up in a concentration camp. So uh, f my mom was the one who got, uh, the first one who got home to Chicago and my dad and I followed. And then when I was of age, my dad passed away. I was closer to him and my mom decided that she's going to stay in Chicago. So I had to save enough money to, to pay my way back. Came back to Prague again after, well, almost three years. Three years. Three years of, of uh, uh, f first it was Asbury Park, New Jersey, where my father. Oh my goodness, Asbury Park of all places? Yes, because my, uh, my uncle was there. Oh. My father's uh, older brother lived, lived there in Asbury Park. So I was there for a while and then my parents got a job to run one of those uh, homes for uh, people who suffered during the war in yeah. Czechoslovakia, so they you know, were kind of protecting them. And they had this uh, so-called council house. And it was not permanent, but it was you know, just when somebody came and had no place to go, they put them into these homes, and my parents were running it for a while. And then my dad passed away. My mom decided she's going to go back to Chicago, which is the I was of age, I had enough money saved, so I went oh, back and we married. Uh, her sister and her brother lived in Chicago. Yeah, well, That's the reason why she went back yeah. to Chicago. Isn't that, what my a story. uncle and my aunt lived in Chicago, so we had somebody to, to stay with. And but, but how did you two how first you? first meet? I need, I need this side of the story here. Uh, when did we meet? I don't remember exactly the date. But uh, it was in, in a concentration camp in Theresienstadt. Was it really? I was in concentration camp since uh, December 42. You came in and February. Kitty and her family came in February 43. And of course, I had a girlfriend before we uh, got to concentration camp, but she was sent very soon uh, with a transport to the east. I don't know if it was to Auschwitz or to some other concentration camp. The whole family perished there. Oh. Uh, and I think that for a short time I started to date the friend of my former girlfriend, but then she was sent again with another transport to the east. And somehow I met... Through you, though. So that was uh, okay. So that was the girl I was dating a little bit, and then she I started was in the to same working group as I. So then I started to date Kitty when I <laughs> was the second girlfriend. Uh, Kitty was at that time how old? Fifteen. 
Fifteen. So that's that's how we met. How can you date in a concentration camp? Well, you don't uh, you don't go anywhere. You don't your, go your, anywhere. You uh, certainly yeah. go, but then, can't go to there was a certain vein of, of you you worked, but you had about an hour or so before right. yeah. lights out in the winter time. You were here five or six in the evening and the curfew was at eight in the evening. But so there was a two hours time period when, when you, you were permitted, uh, permitted to be out of the barracks and you walked on the main street back and forth the same way as people in the small villages or s small towns walk, the young people were free to walk there and they were talking and they, they met each other. So that was the way how we were dating. And of course the Theresienstadt was a special uh, special place where there was a very, very full cultural life. Uh, there were lectures, they were theaters, they were recitation circles there. So we often went for one or the other of these uh, performances together. So this was a far different kind of concentration camp than Auschwitz, well, you, for example. Actually, you were fed the same way, which means very little. Yeah. Uh, you had to work, regardless of what you did yeah. in, in, in the previous life. There was no schooling, because you had to work. At the time you were, I think it was 13, that you had to work. Uh, and they would tell you what to do and uh, where to do it and uh, so I've, I had quite a collection because I moved around. Oh, yeah, no, it was uh, Theresien or German called it Theresienstadt, Czechs called it Theresien. It was a small town some 60 miles northwest from Prague in the border region of Bohemia and it was a fortress built by Joseph II in the 17th century. So it was a fortress which is, it was closed. And the German decided to take it to move all the Czech inhabitants away from the city. There was a lot of military barracks there and use it as a ghetto or assembly uh, place for all the Jews from Bohemia was about 80,000 Jews and then some Jews from Germany and from Austria before they will move them to the camps in the east which was were mainly not at the time when they started but later on it, they were extermination camps. So out of the uh, small town that normally kept about 6,000 people they created a ghetto concentration camp with some 40 50,000 people wow okay. no kidding so the barracks oh, the houses my. everything was full overcrowded oh. with people there was no privacy there in the in this room there would be some 20 people Right. They were three the tiers beds. This is a relatively small yeah. room. Yeah. There, there were three tiers beds all around and probably a small table in the middle. That was it. Now you were yeah. you were eighteen? She was fifteen? I was, yeah. Oh uh, how I want to know what your go back in time and tell me what your feelings were. When they moved you there, was there fear? Or did you have a feeling that you could survive this or what? What was your feeling when they moved you there? When you are eighteen it's uh, the main feeling is an adventure see that it's an adventure it's something yeah. not for not for me looking no back on no it, i wouldn't go back now but, it but when you adventure. are 15 when you are 15 when you are 18 everything is an adventure i didn't know yeah. did you have a political yeah. mind back then were, were you thinking I don't in terms think of so. politics no, no no i don't think so i know first of all we we moved in terezin from a small town in eastern part or central part of Bohemia called Pardubice. It was about 20, 25,000 people there. And we were up totally ostracized there at that time because all the anti-Jewish laws separated the Jews from all the other inhabitants. Not only that we have to wear uh, the star of David, uh, people were not permitted to talk with us, but we couldn't 
go through certain places. We, wow. couldn't, we couldn't go through squares, we couldn't go through the parks, we couldn't go to the movies. We were limited with our shoppings for one or two hours a day. So to a certain point it was a relief to get out of this in a place where you, you can do everything. Huh? Is it how, you know, we can, it's hard for us. We can't understand that. There's no way we can possibly understand I was 15 it. at that time and uh, it was, for me, it was a relief because we lived in a place where there are no Jews, which means we had nobody to talk to. We, we had absolutely no contact with anyone. So uh, no. coming to a camp where not, nobody but ours, it was a certain relief. You know, so it's, it's a different way from his what life. A what a perspective. Yeah. Unbelievable. So we knew when we are going because of the, the Nazis and the Czech government just prepared and organized plan and they liquidated one region of the country after the other, right, or made it Jew free, moved everybody to the camp. Of course, what we didn't know and what we realized very soon after we came is that it was a transient camp that not too many survived there because they were sending somewhere else no one knew where they were sending and no one knew what happened to them because there were no uh, f correspondence no reports no news from them once you didn't learn that until much later then we practically learned it only after the war or when we got there i we were lucky Kitty was lucky because her mother was American-born and that protected her and her family from being sent to the East. Really, so to a, with the exception of your brother, with the exception of your brother, but your father, you and your mother were protected. You were privileged that you stayed in Theresienstadt until the end of the war. And I was protected and my mother was protected, which I learned very late some couple of years ago only, because my father, I didn't know what my father was doing. I knew that he was doing some administrative work in, uh, in the government of the ghetto, but I didn't know that he was one in, in a central underground cell that organized. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I learned it only in 1998 or 1999. Huh? Isn't that and, amazing? No and, idea until yeah. till now. And somehow we started to feel very safe when people were called to another transport because the transport were sent in a certain period of time and the pink slips were distributed to individual people and they had to be assembled in a certain place and shipped in two days to the east. But somehow this always missed us. So we, most of our uh, friends who went to Terezin, to Terezin with us in December 42 from Pardubice and from the surrounding area disappeared. And we were there, we were there through 43, we were there through 44, and only in October 44 the Nazis decided to liquidate practically the ghetto by sending in one month 20,000 uh, labor capable, which means healthy and strong people, to the east, to Auschwitz. And out of these 20,000, probably 2,000 survived. This was so-called liquidation transport. And only after the war we learned that this was done because they were afraid that there will maybe some uprising of in the ghetto against the Nazis to the end of the war. So they just secured themselves by sending everybody out. So my father and myself, we were sent with the third transport and my mother followed, I think, with the fifth or sixth transport. I know that my father was sent immediately to the gas chamber because we were separated <coughs> after we arrived to Auschwitz. And because I was strong and young, I was sent with a small group who survived this transport to the camp and then to a satellite camp where uh, we work as slave, as laborers. Did you know what happened to your father at that time or did you find out later? 
I didn't know at that time, I mean, I didn't know immediately because I didn't know about gas chambers, anything like this. I only knew that he went to one side and I went to the other side. And after two or three days, I said, I talked to a prisoner who was there for a longer time. I said, can you tell me what happened to the group of people who were just separated from our group at the uh, train station? And he showed me. There were these big chimneys with very black smoke. There. Said, you see, that's where he is. And you were, at this time, you were how old? Was that a year uh, later where you were 19 then? Was, yes, I was 19. Yeah. Did then, you start to get the idea that things were pretty scary about that time? Well, I got the idea immediately after we arrived to, we knew that, that Auschwitz-Birkenau is a very bad concentration camp. And when we were sent from Terezin to the east, they told us, you are going to build a new labor camp. And then when we arrived and we were just thrown out of the, of the train, and we saw the SS guards with the guard dogs and the capos, which were mainly the old-timer prisoners, they were mainly Poles, with sticks beating us and shouting us that that's, and of course, the name of the train station, Auschwitz Birkenau, is that's bad. And then when we walked through uh, on a small road with huge, tall wire fences on both sides and prisoners in striped dresses were calling, asking for bread and running to the fence and the guards were shooting on them from the uh, towers, then we knew that it's a very bad place, of course. Right? But we didn't know at that time, we didn't know anything about gas chambers and, and this massive gases, gassing that we learned a little bit later. And where were, where was Kitty at this time? Kitty well, stayed in Paris. Um, you stayed there. Well, actually, I got an invitation which I didn't take. You had a pink slip on your bed that you are supposed to be at this and that hour here or there. And when I got this one, I, I decided that I'm going to do a little bit of my own. So I moved into the place of a girl who already left. And I got away with it in the, all this commotion. I got away with it. And I thought if, if they want... there was watching over her. I know. It was just that I decided I'm not going to obey because... Uh, well, if she decided she wasn't going to obey. Well, I... Is still that way? I, I mean... traveled twice because we, <laughs> we, got caught, we got caught after hours. Yeah, she... She does it even now, whenever she's supposed to do something. <laughs> <laughs> I get away from it. <laughs> so you stayed there? I stayed there until the Russians liberated us. And you had no contact for how long after that? Well, well in between the time he left and... That was, and that was October 44. I was liberated in... Uh, actually, it's two days in... January 21st, 1945. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we do. Isn't that, and we're, we, we're recording this on the 20th day of January, yeah. so that will be a... 60 years from 60 That will be an anniversary tomorrow. Had you thought about that until Calvin just said that? I, I, 60 I, years I, tomorrow? I, I, it's, actually, it's, it's actually the liberation time of, of Auschwitz now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and my, my, my. We were, for, we were not in Auschwitz at that time, but we were about 30 miles away from Auschwitz because the Auschwitz was the central camp and then there were, was a lot of satellite, satellite camps. Satellite camps. Right? So I was in one of the satellite camps. There was about 1,400 people there and we worked on repairs of uh, uh, trains. Trains, yeah. And in January, and some week, 10 days before, so which means after 15th of January, we started to hear cannons. Oh, really? From cannons from a long, from time, long ways time, away. time away. But we knew that means that the Soviets are moving. Yeah? And January 18, we were called early in the morning, and instead of going to the work, just we were marching away from the camp. Everybody marched. I remember this still. It was everybody moved very slowly. It was cold. 
small amount of snow. We walked through the fields. People were falling on the left, on the right. The moment somebody just couldn't walk anymore, he was shot. <coughs> so there was a trail of dead bodies. These people just, were being killed near you? In, yeah, in, yeah. Because the guards were walking alongside us. And imagine that about 14,000 people is moving oh, man. in twos or threes. And somebody is too tired, so he just slows down and then she, he falls down. So they shot him immediately, left them there. And in the front of this long train of us, some prisoners were pushing carts with the belongings of the guards. And we walked all the day ended somewhere late in the afternoon. I don't know if it was. You had no idea where you were headed? No idea. It, apparently, we were heading to the west. Yeah. We ended somewhere else. If either it was an empty school or empty church or something. We got a piece of bread, and fell asleep on the floor and slept. Woke us early in the morning. We marched the second day. I became so tired that I really didn't know if I should walk or not walk. So somehow I got to the front and caught one of the cars. Instead of pushing it, I was just holding to it. You know, holding to it. So the, you were pretty resourceful yeah. even then. So I, the car was dragging me. Yeah, and oh. again we reached a place where we stayed overnight. And the third day we arrived to another concentration camp called Blehammer. And that was on the border of Odra River, and it was a huge concentration camp. I think Primo Levi uh, was there. It was close to the big chemical works. Still, the prisoners wa were in the camp, so they were distributed among the other prisoners. It was warm there. I fell in a bed. I don't know who was sleeping there, and I fell asleep. <laughs> Boy, I tired, dead, dead tired. You must have been pretty strong. To uh, march for three days with only pieces of bread, yeah. very little to well, drink. How were you dressed? How were, yeah, what did you have for clothes on? Just you, uniform, just striped uniform? Uniform, striped uniform, yes. Not warm clothes. Not warm. I tell you, th there were two things that really were the worst part of being there in, the con in Auschwitz and in this uh, cold and hunger. And you never die fast when you are cold or when you are hungry. Yeah, it and takes weeks I, and weeks. I think our, the younger people in our audience should think about it a little bit because when they study about this time period, it seems like ancient history. I remember, I swear, this is real. when I survive, or if I survive at the time, I'll never go skiing or skating <laughs> again. <laughs> never. <laughs> so cold, so cold. Yeah. Now, you must have lost friends along that march people that you had become familiar with things that you would people that you had talked to did you make friends no you didn't do make too many friends because you worked 10 or more hours a day so you work in a group of i work in a group of four or five people but they are all older than i was and you could you didn't have time to to talk to communicate when you were because you were always supervised by the nazis by the, the guards were moving among you and the couples were walking there so you did what you have to the head of our group was a young guy he was a hungarian he was pretty nice and uh, but it was mainly just what i have to do and how i have to do it the only thing he told me, because I, I had time from time to time, because when they were preparing uh, material to close the hole in the train, because we got, were getting trains that were bombed, so they, four guys or three guys were preparing stain, uh, steel plates, and I was in charge of heating bolts in a special electric machine and I put the big bolt into it and when it was red hot I had to grab it in the forceps run put it through the holes and then one guy hold it and the other one has an electric hammer and uh, yeah. just melted it. 
So when they were preparing these plates to close the holes, I was f without uh, work. So I grabbed a small uh, pile with uh, grease and I walked through the yard and was greasing the wheels of the uh, trains that were there. And I tried to look in every train and from time to time I found a turnip or a potato or something. Oh, come Side. on. In the cars. In the cars, right? Because this were the, oh. as they were transporting it to the east. Sure. The, so I just carefully grabbed it so that the guards didn't see me and brought it back. And under the machine where I was heating the bolts, I had a pile with water to cool the bolts when they were too hot and they were and I didn't have to use them. So I threw them in the pile of water and I always cool my forceps there because they were becoming. Yeah. So I put the potatoes and turnips in the pile of water, started heating the bolts, throwing them there to the end of the <laughs> I shift. I can see where this is going. To the end of the shift, we had a couple of boiled potatoes or some boiled turnip that we just split among That is the that. most amazing story, but you know what it proves to me? The tremendous power of the human spirit. Oh, yeah, well. You were young and strong, and a lot of 19-year-olds are listening maybe to this program, watching this program, and they've never even dreamed of anything like this. And for you, you were in a survival mode. Yeah, you, I think that that's one of the natural instincts next to the sex instinct, right? to survive, to survive. And the fact is that when you are cold and when you are hungry, you are dying very slowly. It's not an that's instant a, That's a point that's very well taken. So yeah, it's you not really like somebody's going to come and yeah. shoot you. Huh? Yeah. So really you try and you do anything Whatever just you to, have to, do. Do, to survive. Did you share your uh, turnips and potatoes? Or yeah, did you, did yeah, you? we shared with it with, with the three or four people that were in my group. So that was probably the best food you had to eat, right? That was a little bit extra that I got. It probably, I don't know, it probably just took me over to survive the whole thing. And this, now mind you, this all happened between October, October and January. And January. October and Think about it. Yeah. And in between, I spent a couple of days in uh, f f f the local, what was it? It was at a hospital. Uh, there was an, something like an emergency. Uh, f f like an infirmary? Infirmary there for people who got sick. And I really, probably from the cold, I got a diarrhea. Uh, a, a dysentery, it's a, a, really a bloody stool. Because yeah. they didn't accept anybody, but yes, yeah, they accepted me there, and it was full of inmates who were sick. But it was warm in the room, it was warm, it was beautiful. Yeah. So they put me in the room, they put me in, I shared the bed with somebody else, I know that the guy had uh, inflamed knee. It, he, he had a knee like a melon. Oh my. He had a fever. He was just shivering there with the fever. Next, I fell asleep immediately when I was there in the warm. The next morning I woke up. He was very quiet, but he was cold. He died through the night, so they just took him out. Another guy came in. Oh man. Next night, again, in the morning, there was a corpse next to me. So I stayed there for three days. I think the worm just helped me to cure me. There was no doctor there. It was some medical technician or somebody. But it was mainly the SS men who came every day. Every inmate had to stand next to the bed. And he checked everybody. And who seemed a little bit healthy was released, had to go. So the third day, they kicked me out. But yes, the worm, the worm temperature in the room just uh, cured me. So I was Isn't okay. that amazing? And those memories are burned into your mind. That's, yes. This, these are few things that you do not forget.
most of that time you do you don't forget even though you weren't always aware of what was happening because you were trying to survive you're trying to work trying to get done did you have any did you have feelings about if i can only get out of here in those days did you did you have a future did you see a future or was it just this moment i try to see the future well you see I tried to survive because I hated the Nazis so much that I really wanted to survive to see how they lost the war and if possible to somehow revenge myself or to kill as many of them as possible, whatever so it you, takes. You did have a, yes. you did have a political you, mind you, that was you, developing. How could you, you help it? Because once the prisoner gave up, he died. Right. So you have to have something to live for. Huh? You had that, whatever that secret ingredient was, you had it. Yeah? I think that at I mean, that my, time... My it, muscles have been tightening yeah. and loosening over here as I'm thinking about what you went through. At, at, I can't at even that imagine. time, probably, it, it's not nice to say it, but that, at that time it probably was the hate that was in me that helped me to survive. It was the hate there was, more there than There's no one else. watching this program who doesn't understand exactly what you're saying right now. So January, then what? Well, after three days, and when we when we reached this Blechhammer concentration camp, the next day, the guards started to go through all the uh, rooms in the aim and were just collecting and assemb assembling the inmates, and the weakest inmates were left behind. So I was the weakest one, so I was left there in the room. The inmates who belong to the camp, who didn't have three days of uh, hungry or the death march behind them, they all were assembled and the guards moved them to the west. They crossed the Odra River, they moved them to the west. Most of them perished later on because they put them in open train cars and ship them all the way to the Germany for weeks and weeks. They were these are, these are stories when the older, older of us have heard these stories. And they froze, most of them froze. froze, most of them froze. I probably was the lucky one that I was left behind. They were guards still in the camp, so we were not able to leave the barrack we were in. And then they started to shoot into the barracks. Apparently they wanted, they wanted the camp and the people, the inmates who were left there, to disappear. And I remember that I was. What do you mean they started to shoot in there? When you at night, you mean? No, during the day. During Just the day, fire, 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 and cannon fire. I remember that I saw the barracks across the street from ours just to be blown out. And somehow, wow. somehow our barrack was saved, and in two days we found out that the guards disappeared. The guards you disappeared. You didn't know that at the time. They're all gone. Yeah, they were, they were gone. So we slowly ventured out of the barrack. And I was there in the barrack with a boy of my age. He was a Romanian Jew. And we decided, okay, the camp is empty. We are free to walk. So we walked out of the camp and somehow we got to the nearby village. Did you know a village was there? You no, just started walking. We just, we just walked. We just walked and came to the village. It was probably 10, 15, min 15 minutes from the camp. But this is winter time. In the winter. We found out that the village was empty because the Germans who lived there were so scared of Soviets that they just left everything behind and ran. ran. A ghost town. Ghost town. So we got in one house. We found ourselves some warm clothes, and oh, my, there was my. food everywhere. We found freshly baked bread was left there. Come I on! You, I yes, never you forget. You must have been in heaven. I never forget the taste of this fresh bread. I never forget the taste of this fresh bread. I mean, they had just left and they just, just ran. Got they, there. Yeah, because the Soviets were so fast moving. Huh? It was such a strong offensive. Do you know the name of that town today? No, no. I know that it was Blechhammer concentration camp, but I don't know the, the village that was close so by. you don't know if that's still a village? 
probabilities. And you know, we were followed then later on some other inmates came in and some inmates really got diarrhea because they started to open the preserves and jellies and everything that was left there and started to eat it. And of course, you, on the weak stomach that didn't oh. have sugar for weeks oh, and months, much. you got it. But we didn't do it. On the way back, we saw two white figures of soldiers moving on the horizon. And we saw that these are the Soviet soldiers. Because the soldiers at that time, well, they had white capes. Sure. And they waved us. So we went to them, but they were two German soldiers. They were two German soldiers. Oh. Now imagine the bad luck. Finally you are out of concentration camp. I can't imagine it. And you meet two German soldiers. They ask us, and they saw that we are from concentration camp because we still had the striped garb. And they just didn't ask us what we are doing out, but they asked if we saw some Soviet soldiers. And we said we didn't see any Soviet soldiers, and they waved us away. And by walking from them, we, that was the time probably that I was the most scared in my life because I always they waited shoot you in the that back. they will shoot us of in the course. back, but they didn't. I think that they were as scared as we were. They were and they were at that yeah. point in time. Because Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You thought that was the end of the road right there, yeah. huh? That was the end of the... Because I didn't realize it only later that you know, this war was not the way as we saw in the movies, that there is one front moving this yeah. way and the soldiers are oh, moving of back. Not. And no, these were units of two or three soldiers moving absolutely independently through the countryside. No, no. When the no. Soviets met the Germans, they shot them. They didn't take any prisoners. Oh, sure. right? They couldn't. How could they move them somewhere oh, else? Right? So the Soviets were there. The Germans were still there. The Germans tried to move away as fast as possible, but they were never sure if some Soviets are not around. So it took about three or we stayed in the camp, and in about two, three days, more of the Soviet soldiers went through, and then finally the cars with, uh, with the provient, with food and with fuel started to move to the east. To the west, and the Soviets had pretty good uh, attitude toward inmates or former inmates. They gave them a piece of paper called bumashka. Everything that paper is bumashka in Russian. Really? Yes. And the bumashka had your name that you told them, and an order to the military police because they put a soldier, usually it were women soldiers or men soldiers, on every crossroad. And the soldier directed the traffic. And you went to the military, uh, this traffic soldier, showed them the bumashka, and he stopped the first car that went to the east, and they and had to you take you. And they had no to take you. No kidding! I've yeah. never heard this before. Yeah. They had to take you. So we decided with my friend, let's go out of here, because should something no. happen and the German will come back and take back no. the concentration camp. Sure, we, no. we have to go to the east, as far yeah. east as possible. So we used the bumashkas and we always drove with the Soviets back to the, back to the east. And where did you end up? The first day we ended in the city. That was the origin of my labor concentration camp called the, no. the Polish name of the city is Lviv. It was Gleiwitz in German. It was a big city. And the uh, suburb of the city was a liquor store. And of course, the Soviets stopped at the liquor store, broke the windows, everything. There was, I think, three or four cars there. And they drank and drank and drank. Oh so we my. left them and we walked. We walked from them and stopped no. in a villa somewhere, broke in the villa and stayed there for a couple of days. No. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? But you were familiar with that, with that area? Uh, no, but we were not because the, con the camp
camp was somewhere on the oh, on I the see. outskirts yeah, of the yeah, city, yeah. but it was it was a nice city. It was apparently there was a battle or a fight there because there were still corpses lying on the streets. Oh eh? my my my! So we stayed there for probably three or four days. Found a lot of food uh, in the villa. Of course, there was no electricity, no warm water, no heating, but we were quite inventive. I remember that. Yeah, you were quite inventive. I've al you've already convinced yeah. me of that. We used some furniture. We broke it and we heated it in the oven, and we cooked ourselves because there was no water running. But they had a very nice wine cellar, so we used <laughs> the wine. <laughs> we used the wine instead of water to cook ourselves some food. Of course. Which of course kept our mood very high, and I remember that I went to inspect some other villas to find what's inside and somewhere I had to kick through the door and as I was crawling through the door I fell asleep there. Isn't that amazing? And I remember that one Soviet soldier just found me there and they probably saw that I am dead. They pulled me out, woke me, I thanked them and just <laughs> walked back. Wow! But from there, we again used our bumashkas and we moved farther east and we ended in uh, Katowice, which is a big Polish city. And there was a uh, f uh, camp there organized by the Soviets for, in for former inmates who were coming from all the satellite camps together. We stayed there, it was Katowice or Sosnowice, it was Sosnowice, which is close to Katowice. But we didn't like it too much, so we left after a couple of days and moved to Krakow, which was a really nice mm -hmm. Polish city. Uh, and there we stayed for a long time. Uh, make living mainly by begging for food. And then my friend found uh, somebody from the countryside who offered us a job in the countryside. So he persuaded me to go with him. So we went to the countryside some hour or two south from uh, Krakow. And we were separated there and worked in two farmers' families. I worked for a lady who had some five or six children, had a small farm, so I was just uh, cleaning for the animals and cutting wood and all these things. But somehow I caught cold, got fever, couldn't work anymore. So they put me on the train and somehow I got back to Krakow and got to the hospital and stayed in the hospital till the end of April. What did you, do you know if you had pneumonia? What happened? I had pneumonia. Oh. I had pneumonia. I had some money so that I paid the, uh, it was not a taxi but a, a, a car with, with uh, the horse, who took me to the St. Lazarus Hospital. I remember the name, St. Lazarus Hospitals. There were nuns there. I just rang the bell, told them I am sick. They didn't believe it, but then they checked my temperature. The temperature was sky high. Yes, so they put me in the bus, stuff, washed me, shaved me, cleaned me, and put me in the bed in a v room. It was a ward with probably 20 or 30 beds on both sides of the sure. walls. And after I fell asleep immediately, tired, they gave me some soup or something. After two or three days I woke up and I had a nightshirt and then I saw something crawling, crawling on the nightshirt. And it was lice. And I don't oh. know how I got them. I never got them. Uh, I was full of lice. Isn't so that I amazing? started to kill them. Like you just Sure. Press the lights between the nails sure. and it just breaks. Killing the lights. The other guys wow. were watching me, watching me. Of 
because they didn't see that I am killing lies. They saw that I am praying the rosary. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, I get the picture now. So it, the next thing, <laughs> the next thing, a priest is sitting next you to are, my bed. This, what, this is, oh, my goodness. Come on. So the priest was there. Yeah. So we had a nice discussion. Of I, I, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I explained to him that I am not a Catholic because I am from Czechoslovakia and they are Protestants there and this and that. So he just left me alone again. To kill you, to kill the last. <laughs> so finally you got rid of him. Yeah. You started to improve not to I, I improved pretty well and they didn't force me to leave. If no. They had a funny, th the only thing I was afraid of, but it never happened to me, the Polish doctors were curing when you had fever, they were putting uh, like little jars on your skin. They heated the jar inside with a flame and put it on your skin and put some 20 jars on your back, on, on, your, on your front. Right? Wow! And kept them, they covered you and kept them, the jars because they didn't have, they had so hot they air, so they just, vacuum. they created vacuum, they yeah, the, the, sucked the your, flame. Yeah. And after they removed them, you, they lowered the fever very fast. And I don't know if they are doing it still now, but it was somehow a very common uh, method. Speaking my curiosity yeah. now, I'll have to do some research on it that. Was, uh, it was a very common method in Poland and I think even in Soviet Union in the hospitals they did this. But I saw a guy who was in pretty good health according to me because he walked through the ward and then they gave him this treatment and he was kaput. He was dead after they removed oh, the sure. jar. <laughs> so I just thought, I hope oh, that they will not give me this treatment. Oh my goodness. And then to the end, uh, sometimes end of April, a new patient came and he was lying next to me in the bed and as much as I remember his story he was bitten by a dog about three weeks ago and he started to feel uh, like a, a, a tingling. tingling in yeah. his fingers so the, the doctor sent him to the hospital his wife came and started to offer him a bowl of soup. We were on the first floor so the window was open and he was pushing her away. He didn't want the soup. In the afternoon from the blue sky he just jumped all four on his bed, fell down. He was, he had rabies. Oh, he had my, rabies. My, my. And that was the first time and I hope the last time that I saw somebody oh. die on a rabies. Oh. No, this guy got one attack after the in the between of the attacks he knew he was conscious and he knew what he is doing through the attacks but he couldn't prevent it first of all i don't know if it's known here probably it is not known here because the rabies is actually eliminated when you meet a rabid dog run to the water when you have rabies, or when the dog has rabies, he hates liquid, water. They don't drink. This guy was thirsty, but he couldn't drink. No, no. He couldn't no. drink. They had to constrain him totally. They tried to give him some injection or something, but in the mid midnight he was dead. So it lasted from mid-morning till midnight. What a horrible thing yeah. to watch. And I just couldn't stay there after, after uh, he died. Next day I left the hospital and used my bumashka and started to move to the east with the Soviet army and the eastern part of Czechoslovakia also li was liberated and the central was liberated. So I came actually <coughs> to Czechoslovakia with the Soviet army and that's the end of the story. And I ended, uh, I ended in my uh, Bears town, in the town where I left 
when was it? In December 42, I found an aunt of mine there, who was not Jewish, who was a widow of my uncle who died before I practically was born or very soon after I was born. <coughs> I stayed with her over the summer and I missed uh, years of school. I missed the whole high school, practically nearly four years of school, and I have to catch it up. My old schoolmates just graduated and they couldn't go to the colleges because the colleges were closed during the war. Sure. The Nazis closed the colleges in yeah. 1939. So after they graduated, they have to work somewhere else. And everybody felt sorry for me. Everybody asked me, what will you do? You miss this, you miss that. So, well, I try to catch up. So I went to the school and the first, one of the first laws the new government issued was that whoever missed the education or something because of the war or because of the Nazi persecution is permitted to go into the class or do whatever <coughs> is necessary to catch up. I persuaded the, the principal of the school and most of the professors, some of them remembered me. And the school was, the class was closed from February till May because of the end of the war. So they opened a special class in June that lasted until the end of August. I entered this class and it was the senior class of the high school made agreement with some of the professors that I plan to go to the technical university, which means I do not need Latin. Aha! I do not need Latin. I told them, listen, I have no time <laughs> to study four years Latin. But yeah. I knew French, I knew German, I knew pretty well Russian, which they didn't know. The history and geography was not there were no examination because everything was changed. Sure, yeah. Of course, think about I, it. <coughs> I knew mathematics because <laughs> I continued to study, to, to learn mathematics with my dad in the concentration camp, and I knew physics. So the only other thing that I missed was the Czech literature. Because I was, I was 15 when I left the school, and now I was 19, and most of the literature you study in the sure. high school. So these were the two subjects that I had to make some arrangement with the professors to get D or C, and the other, I took the exams and I just graduated practically at the same time as all the others, or a year later than the others, but we started the university at the same time. Because you went to school during the summer? <laughs> yes. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> well, you must have had a tremendous thirst for knowledge, yeah, so and I'm, that wasn't... To, to a certain point, it helped me somehow to, uh, to see the future and to f not to forget, but to put in the back of my mind all the, all the history, because they were people who came and they were always reminiscing what they lived through and what they survived, and they actually, you know, they got half crazy from this. Right? Well, and and well, adjust. you can understand now, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. They couldn't adjust to the new life. And I just didn't have time to, to, to think about, I lost my parents, and I lost my relatives, and I lost this, and I lost that. I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to catch up, I have to be the same as all the others. You had some, you had and you have some very special qualities, and you must appreciate that now, because you, you've talked, you've given us a story here today that's the likes of which I've never heard before, and I've heard many stories. So you had some... You had some pretty good quality. You had pretty good genes, I think. Don't you, huh? When you look back on it, you say, how did I do that? I how did I know what to do? Where did, how did I know to crawl in there? And how, you at, know. At, at my age now, I say it's the genes and the slivovitz. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's exactly what it is. So, okay, that was all finished. You went to, and you finally went to the university. Yep. Well, right there, right? The university was right there? You, uh, university was in the Prague. No, I moved then. So I got my graduation papers end of, sep end of August, and then I moved to Prague. Ah. I lived with my aunt there. 
who was married to a German who never divorced her. So I stayed with her and uh, I met Kitty there. I'm, Kitty, I met Kitty before because I went to visit my, my aunt in Prague even when I stayed in Pardubice and we had an agreement with Kitty that when I will survive and she will survive, we both will contact my aunt because we Isn't knew that my that aunt amazing? will... Isn't that amazing? So you had a plan. Yeah. So when well, maybe that's what made, helped you to get through, so, huh? So when I came to my aunt in Prague, sometimes in June or July, she told me, well, Kitty was here and she lives here and here, and she gave me her address. So I went over there and we... Did you really think you'd ever see him again? I knew I'm going to see him because you, I knew him. You, you knew There's he was one was tough guy, huh? Yeah. That would keep him from surviving. Isn't that, to me, I, this I is true. I didn't even think that something happened to him. Isn't that something? So there was a plan, and you did get oh. back together, and yeah. there was a magic, and... So then we started dating in real. Right? And I was in Prague. I attended the Technical University in Prague. And uh, Kitty took some uh, classes in Russian and English in a language institute. Because they, uh, at that time, they decided that they will move to the United States. Her mother moved. The only relatives that we had were actually in the States. In Chicago? Well, most of them in Chicago, but one in Asbury Park. Yeah, in Asbury Park, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, because I had relatives in Asbury Park, too. So then what? Well, then you well, I studied for four and a half years to get my master degree in chemical engineering. And in between, Kitty returned just a couple of months before I got the degree. We got married. And then I decided to go to graduate school to stay at the same university as a graduate student to get my PhD oh. in biochemistry and microbiology. So in 1953 I got my PhD and by that time we had a child, the older one, and I would say that's the end of the story. Then I changed some job. Yeah, there have been so many ends of so many stories. That's the beginning of, the, of another part of your life, right? I got a job in a research institute for, for food industry, where I worked until 1963. Then I had some disagreement with uh, the director, so I left worked for some time in a research institute for antibiotics. By that time, I had a, a very good credential as a, a technical or industrial microbiologist in Czechoslovakia. Worked in the research institute for antibiotics, which helped me to learn some new technology. And from there, I got an offer to join the Technical Microbiology Department of uh, Czechoslovakian Academy of Sciences. They had a new institute, a microbiological institute. So I got an offer to join them. I got a laboratory there with some eight people. And I stayed with them until I left for United States. It's it's been quite a quite a ride. I I feel as though I'm I'm totally exhausted just listening to this these things that you did in the places you went. But we've got more to talk about, and we'll continue this program in a moment. We stop the tape for just a moment, and we realize that we have about two hours more material to cover. So we're going to try to do it in the next few minutes. First of all, I want, this is a, a wonderful story about you two dating in the, in the camp. So we're going to go back a little bit in time in your story, but this is such a cute story. Tell me what okay. happened. Uh, in the summer of 1944, it was, uh, we were dating with Kitty. It was hot inside, so I was uh, walking her to her uh, 
to the barracks. Mm -hmm. Barracks where she left, but we, she didn't leave immediately, and we stayed between the door of the barracks. And it was after eight in the evening. Of course, the curfew was eight in the evening. To our surprise, a young man in civil crosses came to us and declared that he is a police, and what are we doing outside when there is a curfew? I said, well, if I said, I have permit to be outside. At that time, I was working as a locksmith, and I had a permit to move freely through the ghetto, even after the curfew. Should somewhere the window was broken or door were broken, I had to go and fix it. So I showed the permit to him, and he asked for the permit or a proof for Kitty that she can be outside. She didn't, of course, have anything. So he took her ID card, uh, ID card were actually the uh, working permits or working proofs, recorded everything, and then she was called to the youth court to be punished. First step, first, on the first step to the barracks. You were almost there. Almost, almost, almost got almost. there. Because she was under age, not only she was called to the youth court, but, but I, also I her father was called to the youth court. Because he's getting into, into problems because of me. And she, <laughs> she was strongly reprimanded for not obeying That's the good. laws of the concentration camp or of the ghetto Terezin being outside. which. You wouldn't care at all if, if you are reprimanded or not, unless you don't have to pay any money, doesn't cost anything. The only problem was that when you were punished like anyway by the court in Terezin, you automatically were included in the next transport to the east. Oh, wow, and now, you never, now. And you never knew when the next transport will go. So then there was a big risk that if in the next two weeks or months or two months, there will be a transport to the east, Kitty will be automatically included and will never be able to get out of it because she had this black spot on her record. I got out of it easily. So, first of all, <laughs> in a couple of days, she declared that she is ill and went to the infirmary and appealed the reprimand at the same time. And she stayed in the infirmary for three weeks, and in three weeks, the head of the ghetto uh, somehow eliminated the reprimand for Kitty. And it was written, everything was, of course, done in German. And it was, she, we have the original documents. You have the I original? Have, have Come it. on! Oh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> those things, How did I, you? I, I kept it. I kept it as a souvenir. When I, should well, I, I want to see it. Should I, 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 should I uh, survive? Then I have something to show off. Because it's not everybody... Bad. You see, I, I went to, and I pretended that I have encephalitis. And I learned it from a girl who had it. Oh, so they actually you were did. both pretty resourceful back then. Yep, in those and days. I thought, well, I have to get out of it, which means that I have to pretend that I've got it bad. Uh, Disease, disease, sure. and I stayed in an infirmary until the, everything kind of went away. In other words, well, they, they never chased after me. They sent me a letter that they forgave me. I have that oh, letter because I saved really? every. Uh, yeah, I saved every paper. How could there. you save all this stuff? Just because I thought it's it's funny. I think it's very funny. I never, never really thought that it, it's something because it's it a, might affect. So it was like a souvenir, huh? Okay, let me hold this up over here, and I'm going to show it. You, you explain to me what okay. that is. Calvin will take a okay. picture of it right here. Uh, let me take it so I can see what it's. That's a. Oh, that that is the invitation. Whoops. To, I'm sorry. To the judge. You can put you got it. Invitation to the judge. And I explained what I could explain, but at the same time, I thought it's kind of shaky with the next transport I'll go. So I pretended to have this encephalitis. I, at that time, I, I'm not quite sure that I didn't catch it because it's very infectious, so you know, you never know. So I stayed there until things kind of 
We were not able to translate it, so we had to send it to my cousin who lived oh, really? in, in Austria, in Germany, in Austria, and she has a friend who worked for the course, and she was able to translate it in this to proper, uh, English. proper English. This is this is that the reprimand, and here are the translations. Oh, okay. Let me, let, first of all, let's show that document. Uh, the reprimand on on the bottom, right? The reprimand, yes. It's on the on the bottom. That's the wide one on the bottom, and that's all in German. No, of course. And there is yeah. my father's place because I'm I'm a no. juvenile, which means that my no. my father is just as punishable as I because yeah. I'm you're... I'm underage. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so Can you put all this stuff in a box or something, or no, I just kept it. Just I kept it. When he went away, so I had every piece of this paper. Is a, this is a translation. In okay, English. I've got to look at this. What was your question? Your name is Kitty. Yeah, it always your real was. name is Kitty. Uh, the nickname yeah. is your name. It's, it, it, here it's a name, and my mom was born in Chicago, so she decided to name me. And isn't that interesting? It says juvenile court. Kitty was summoned for curfew violation. Kitty's father was summoned to attend court proceedings against his daughter. And it goes on to say the proceeding is against uh, the juvenile. Kitty, is it Lowy? Yeah. Lowy. Lowy. The address, when you're supposed to be there, June 11th, 1730 hours. Uh, what main, what street, what room? Herewith, as the accused, I'm the accused, you are informed and requested to appear at a given time. Chairman of the Youth Commission, June 8, 1944, Dr. Friedman, Juvenile Court. And the same is true the for your father. So laughable, you know, Isn't that curious. amazing? They blew it out of proportion just oh, in the case. Isn't that? And it's I thought, in, okay, so I'm going to play. Isn't that funny? It's, but you knew you knew it was a game. Well, it, it was not. But a it game. wasn't a very. It, it was pretty serious. The because with the next transport, you, you go. would have been gone. Yeah. So it wasn't but a I game. Wasn't there. I was in the, the, but the, now, the, by July 9th, yeah, they forgave me. You are herewith informed that the elder of the Jews has extended a pardon to you regarding the judgment of June 11th. Blah blah blah. Rendered against you. The severe reprimand was given for your disregard of the curfew that regulates the time allowed to leave the grounds. The above mentioned judgment against you is thereby declared null and void. Nice, isn't it? Court judge. That's a thing that nobody has. You oh, can see that my. the address is different here. Yeah. And there is infection here because she was still waiting for this. I that in I a secure place in the infirmary. So I in the infirmary. I pretended to have a really serious disease that was very, it. very complicated. It. I love it. I went through that. You know, I knew all the things that I have to do in order to, to, to make it believable. Sure. You did and then it. I was, then I was in a... In a, a good a, actress, huh? They couldn't get to me. I love it. What a wonderful story. What else have you got in here that you might, find, yeah, that you might well, think is interesting for our viewers? This is... We, these are laser copies of the original. We have the originals, but the, I am taking this to the schools when I am invited. Oh, you told to me you talk. go to the schools to talk to when, the young when kids. We, when we are, when we are asked or invited, so we are taking some of these to the schools. So the now we're back with a fresh battery in our camera, and it's it's nice to be invited. How how often do you go to the schools? Well, about a month ago, you, you were the you last one? Not very often. I don't know. Some schools do not know that we are willing to. Uh, After this program is, view, is aired, maybe we some you'll get some calls, ourselves. you know, about it. No, we is we it try not, not to advertise because we don't actually enjoy doing it, but we think it's necessary to do it. I think it's important. I, uh, that's it's why necessary. we're sitting here to do First of all, I'm just charmed by meeting both of you people, but I've... I learn every time I interview somebody such as you, I learn the, the tremendous power of the human spirit to survive things that we can never. I mean, we gripe about it being cold out today. I know, but but guess what? We can walk inside where it's warm. 
But on the other side, if, if you are daring enough, like uh, I got an invitation to, to join the transport and I said, well, I'm not going to go. So I moved out of my bunk and uh, well, got who, into another one. Who would have dared to do that besides you? I saw that. Now that you look back on it. I felt like uh, if they need me, they have to come and get me because I'm not going to volunteer. So I pretended to be very sick and I got into the infirmary. So I was safe for a while until it blew over, until the next transport, of course. This is unbelievable. While I have you on the camera here, I want you to, to answer some questions that Calvin had before about how many people you lost during that time period. Now, you started to explain a little bit about how your extended family and how in, it was it's an extended not, family that lived with you I think because... It's, it's better to, to, to start with those who survived. Yeah. My grandma, my father's uh, mother, survived because she was, she was very, well, an old lady who, who is in camp. She didn't, you know, she didn't. She actually stayed there and waited until the war was over because she wanted to survive the war so when her kids come, because she didn't believe that they won't be able to come, which they didn't, because my father was the only one who survived on his side of the family. Ah, oh, okay. And uh, as far as my mom's, my uncle got out of, uh, you know, Prague because he was born in, in Chicago, so he got out. Uh, my mom's youngest sister perished also. She was born American, but uh, there was some kind of a law that it, it was a certain date and she was born before that date. It was rather complicated. Anyway, she didn't make it. That was my mom's youngest sister. And, uh, well, to, to make this story short, uh, let's talk about those who survived, because the rest didn't. There were cousins and uh, a, lot, a lot of people who didn't make it, close relatives. You said something very interesting. In your extended family at home, your, bro your My, father had a young, the youngest brother who was brought up as your brother, because right. he was closer to your age. Yes, he was the youngest, the youngest child of my grandma, and he stayed with us from six. He was about six years old. Before he started school, he moved over to our place, and uh, he actually was, he made the mistake as an adult to marry during the war and having a little baby. And since he was uh, already in trouble with the, with the Germans, they put him onto some, labor and when she was called she had to go with the baby never knowing that she's pregnant so I had a little cousin born in the camp which we all pampered as much as we could a sweet little kid and uh, his little sister was very very close in age actually they were about uh, a year apart so hmm. he was born in camp his name was Peter and he perished in Auschwitz with his mother and his sister. Oh boy. So then uh, she had uh, two young children. Uh, uh, my uncle was not with them because he got into some trouble and he was sent to Auschwitz where he uh, perished actually on the day before they took over the camp because they put people in, in January on open uh, railway, of, um, I don't know what you call those things. Yeah. It's open, uh, and they little, all froze. Yeah, they're like open cattle cars, and they were wide so open. And the yes. whole bunch of who, survi who survived until the end, uh, before they can, they they, fro the train. they froze to death. Just, they're horrible stories. The story. He must have been about 28 at that yeah. time, th uh, tw 27 or 28. I don't don't remember his birthday. So that was the one. Then the, my father had a sister who was single, who probably got one of these attacks that she had quite often when she got excited. So she, what happened to her, we never knew, because there's, there's no way of finding out what no her... Uh, no, but the, she was not well. She had these, these attacks of, of shaking. And there was another one who was married to a German who was protected for some time, who ended up in a camp and didn't return. So that was my father's family. My mother was quite safe, except the youngest sister who lost her American citizenship. Also, she was born in Chicago because somehow she was born in the time when it was not 
you know, you, uh, you had no excuse. So she died with her, with her uh, husband, who happened to be my father's cousin, and their two kids. The youngest one was brought up in our family too. Uh, his name was Otto, and uh, he died when he was 16. With, with his real, but he lived with us. Also, he had parents of his own, but uh, none of the kids stayed at home. The, the oldest, uh, his oldest brother lived with my grandpa in Prague. So they didn't keep the kids with him because my, uh, my aunt, my mother's sister, married my father's cousin, who during the war lost part of his, uh, uh, what you call that bone? Skull. Skull? Yeah. yeah. And he had attacks that he really was not, uh, he was not, it wasn't safe to keep the kids with him. So the older one went to, to live with grandpa, the younger one lived with us as, as my brother. We always had somebody living there who... who Isn't that amazing? What so, story. but we we had a big place, so one more didn't make much difference. <laughs> it sounds like our house with <laughs> with Kay and I. Well, you want to uh, come in? Yeah, we got plenty of supper. Come on. Uh, my parents were never not never involved with them. Yeah, you know they they knew that it was necessary to take them into into the family, but us kids we lived kind of an extra life. Boy, and here it's hard to believe that anybody can live this kind of a life and still be talking about it. And here we are, in no, 2005, we telling had, these we had, stories. We had lunch together. Lunch was the big meal at, in, yeah. at noon, and the, my parents were there. And we knew that my father had this office downstairs. Yeah. We lived on the first floor, and my my father was the director of a big factory, so he they lived down. It's, it's amazing. And here we are telling the story all these years later. Now let's talk about, let's do the family thing with you. We talked about a little bit about this before, but how many of your family members uh, survived? You were uh, the only child. I am the only child. So I counted once from my mother and my father family that who perished, and it came to about 37 people. Which was this was much good. later that you got into the geology, right? Yeah, I practically only after I retired. And, and had time to look back. Two, two things brought me to it. One was uh, a <coughs> book or two books that I'll show you that were published in uh, Bohemia, 1996, I think. Uh, they list all the Jews from Bohemia that were transported to Theresienstadt or Theresien and who perished and who survived. No and transport so after you saw transport. a lot of names you knew. Yeah, there. transport after transport. So I decided I'll, I'll look for all my relatives. I'll find out when actually they were born, when they were deported to Theresien, when they were deported <laughs> from the Theresien, when they perished. And I found to my aunts that they were born at the same year. I said, that's not possible. I had one cousin who died last year who lived in Toronto. So I called her or wrote to her and said, when was your mother born? And she asked me, why do I need it? And I explained it to her. And <laughs> then she said, you know what? I have a diary of our grandmother that she wrote. Come on. That she wrote when she got married. and." All her children are listed there. So I'll send it to you. I totally forgot that I have it. Isn't that so she sent me the diary. I have the diary. Isn't uh, that I, beautiful? I transcribed it because it was nearly illegible, and I translated it. That was before the age of computers. Oh, right? my it was 1996 goodness. or 1997, I did it. And from this, I started to get interested in my family and built a family tree and found out how many really of my family perished and how many, I knew how many survived, not too many, but I made a family tree from my mother-sized family, which was really a big family. Take that page out. I want to just show it briefly so people can know what, you, what you've done. And this is wonderful for posterity so that people would know. This is the family... Uh, this is the family tree. That's pretty neat. This is family tree of my mother's side of family. Yeah. And 
at that time I found out using my grandmother's diary where my great grandparents are buried. Did you really? Yeah. Have you been there? Yes. Not oh, only I that, know. I contacted the custodian of the. First of all, I had to find out if the cemetery exists or not, because many cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries, were, were just yep. dissolved. dissolved totally. Yeah? But this is a historical cemetery, and it survived. And there was a new custodian, and I contacted him. And after six months, he co he called me or wrote me back that all the papers disappeared. So, I, but I found a historian in the little town, and he copied them before they were stolen. So oh, from that, I found on. I found the, the the graves of your great grandparents, and after the winter will be over, I'll clean it, and I'll send you a picture of it. He not only cleaned them. But he got a small grant from the from the town and from somewhere else, and he decided that he will clean the part of the cemetery and renovate the part of the cemetery where these two graves oh, were. That's pretty neat. And sent that's me all the pictures neat. of the progress, how it was cleaned. And I visited them, I think in 1998 I was there. And they are really beautiful gravestones there with names and with everything. Oh, so I that kind of brings it all together, yeah. doesn't it? So, right? so I know where my great grandparents are buried. These are these two. Way up in the top. Huh? Mm -hmm. And they had eight children. Of course, some of the children died when they were young. One died on tuberculosis, one got drawn. But some survived. And this is my grandmother and my grandfather, grandmother Emily. Stein, yeah, so these were Steins, mm -hmm. and she married Adolf Geschmay. They perished in Terezin. They both were alive. They were deported to the concentration camp and perished, died there. Yeah. And they again had eight children. Yeah. My mother was the youngest one of eight. And she married my father. I survived here. But you can see that the whole family is like this one, which was my, uh, this was brother of my uh, grandmother. The whole family so perished. I know. It's, it's amazing. And here again, the whole family is perished. You can, you can yeah, see. And you look at these young people in their 40s. Yeah. You know, 19, in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, and that's, oh, it's, it's sad beyond beyond words, but it's a story that must be told. Uh, and that's why it's important for you to talk to us today. That's why it's important when you're asked to go into the schools, tell the stories, because it's a story that has to, that has to be told. Yes, Have you on the other hand, talking about stories, we, the two of us, decided not to bring it up in front of our kids, never, ever. When they were young. When, when, when they are too young no. and but when they were older, they started to ask. And then, for a long time, uh, the younger one told me, I asked Peter why, and he's, he explained to me that it might be a burden for us, so the, our parents, the two of us, decided not to talk about it unless they are old enough to know what it's all about. And that was a deal that we made before the kids were born. Isn't that it? You know, just just uh, because we, we saw people who were you have to finish your soup because uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there was no soup, yeah. which has absolutely no, no sense for a child. No. Well, you, you, you've got an amazing perspective, but your lives are, are very special compared to many other I people who went through I had one advantage. This. I didn't have to go to work. I could stay home with the kids. Yeah. You know, because mm -hmm. the, we used what we had, and uh, I didn't have to go out and work in order to, to keep the family in food. So that that was one advantage that uh, you know I could stay home with my kids. Both of them were preemies, which means that it's double work. Wait, I'm not very good at having babies because I spent uh, six months in bed to wait for the second one. Otherwise, he wouldn't be. And he still uh, was. Both of them were preemies. You know, so it's very complicated for an, a child that has to be fed small portions very often, day and night. But uh, it was worth it.
course it's it was worth it. it because the, we have really good kids, both of them. Yeah, and close to us, uh, you know, happily married with children of their own. So we have actually, Paul has two and Peter has two, which means uh, four grandchildren. Uh, two of them are already adults because Peter is over 50, 55 or something like that. I keep, I don't keep track of how old my but, sons but who's are. counting? So one is, li is living in Toronto because he married, uh, he was at one semester at the, the school in, in uh, like, the, uh, what it's called. Sometimes I've got, Radio. Grebel Peter. Look at the books. Amazingly, our time is almost up, not because I don't have the energy to continue, and Calvin's shoulder's holding up pretty well, but we've uh, just about uh, exhausted a two-hour tape because it's been such a fascinating and important interview. These are the books that Vladimir was talking about, mentioning uh, all those people, right, from near where you lived, Right? Yeah. yeah, from the whole Bohemia, Thousands. or protectorate of, of Bohemia and Moravia. And so you went all through this and found your relatives? Yes, and it's transport by transport, when they were sent to Terezin, and where they went from, when they went, when they were sent from Terezin to Auschwitz or to another concentration camp, and that's if they return or not. Yeah. So when you take, for example, the transport that I went with, the, the transport had letters, my transport had a letter CG. Somebody had to go through and compile all of this, I can't even imagine. So you have transport CG, CG. Pardubice, we arrived in Terezin on the 9th of December 1942. So it's all there? Yes, 560 perished. 46 liberated. Oh boy, oh boy. You are both amazing people. Tremendously amazing, charming, wonderful people. Yeah. To look in a person's face, you cannot tell what pain there was in the past. Somehow, the pain doesn't go anywhere. Time doesn't heal all the wounds, but somehow you have managed to get on with your lives and you've You've grown into wonderful human beings. You've raised a tremendous family. And I think we're blessed to have you living here in Plattsburgh and sharing this story with us so other people can keep this alive. Uh, have you ever visited the Holocaust Museum? I did, yes. You did? I did. What was your reaction, just quickly here uh, before we end? I have a, a Holocaust Museum as such is very well built and the exhibition is excellent. As far as uh, the science or research goes, I have my doubt. For one reason, uh, some time ago, it's not so long time ago, I offered them uh, laser copies of the original documents we have. The Jewish Museum in Prague and Institute of Terezin in Bohemia accepted these laser copies and were very happy that they got them. Uh, Holocaust Museum wrote me a letter, a nice letter, that they cannot accept the copies, that either we will give them originals or nothing. That they scientists require originals for their studies. Isn't, not that, laser isn't copies. that amazing? So, so that stroke me so being, you, so being so scientist myself. That yeah. told me like something, you know, they are so uppity. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Czech word, isn't it? Uppity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I know exactly or, or how you feel. Pretentious. Or pretentious. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I want to thank you both for allowing Calvin and I to come into your home to share these experiences, not very pleasant experiences with you, but... It's a part of who you are, and it's a story that must be told. I want to wish you the very, very best, both of you, in 2005. You too, Pepe. He's, he's being good for the first time today. He's just yeah, he saying, is. okay, they're going to be out of here soon, and I could tear this place apart. We had a hard time keeping him this way. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, thanks so much. Thank you best for coming. Best of everything and everything you do, best of everything for your families. And who knows where we